John Moores and welcome to Montgomery Week in Review. The Rural Maryland Council will focus on the problems surrounding our mosquito infestation in our community as it relates especially to prevention of Zika. Charlotte Davis, Executive Director of the Council, is here to give us the details and explains the grants that will be given out soon to localities. The League of Women Voters is having its national convention here in Washington this very weekend. Linda Barnes, Montgomery County's League's president, is here to tell us all about it as she stays with us before she has to rush down to Washington for the convention. The women's vote has been discussed since long before 1920 when finally women in the United States got the right to vote in every state. Mariana Cordier, a local attorney, is here to tell us what this vote means to all of us today. Montgomery County Media, MCM, it's right where we are right now, is busy all year, but summer seems to be its busiest season. Tony Spearman Leach from MCM, one of the grand poobahs of MCM, is here to tell us all about it and so much more about what's going on at MCM. Charlotte, welcome back. Thanks for having me. It, this, this Zika, it's, it's, it, we don't know what to expect yet in the United States. We saw the horrors in Brazil with the, the, the birth defects of children. But you're here uh, uh, helping to spearhead some of what Maryland's doing to fight against it. Tell us about what you're doing. Yeah, um, we're out of the Maryland Department of Agriculture, and so they do have an active mosquito control program. Uh, so we're very concerned, particularly with this particular mosquito that has uh, can live and survive here in Maryland. That's the tiger mosquito, is that it's, right? Well, there's two types, the tiger and then the Aedes aegypti, okay. which is that particular right. one with the Zika. Um, it can survive up in here. They don't think it'll winter here, right. um, but it is. it can survive. We're warm enough. Uh, and they're a container breeding mosquito. So these right. aren't associated with standing water, flood waters, it is containers. So we're asking the homeowners when it, after it rains, such as today, to please empty out you know, all your containers, anything that could collect standing water, because that's where they're gonna breed and congregate. It takes, it takes such a short time, isn't it, for, mm -hmm. for, for the mosquito to breed yeah. and come out. So it's you know, leaving it there for just a few days where we've lost the battle. What, yep. I mean, is it, what, in particular, what are you all going to be doing or what are you going to be leading counties and localities to be doing? Well, they're mainly going around and doing an education campaign, uh, you know, radio spots, going out to community groups to talk about this, you know, empty out. It's mainly emptying out your containers and I, cleaning up your yard. And I just, I just asked you before about one of the things, my rain barrel, <coughs> which are supposed to be wonderful, have rain barrels, you distribute the water differently, right. but this one has a mesh top. Right. Mm. And you need to have a hard cover. Okay. And it yeah. was full of mosquitoes last year. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. put a hard cover. So you need yes. to have that con everything be contained right. if it's got if you've got water, open yeah. up, you've got to get rid of that water. Yes. Okay. Right. What uh, questions come up, I know, uh, around because of the, the need for bees and the problem that that, that mm -hmm. honeybees have had yes. and, and other bees. Does going after mosquitoes hurt our bees as well, or is there is this part of like a collateral damage that we should be it's ready for? It's a collateral for? damage. Uh, the biggest fear, because you know, to apply pesticides on an, in agricultural lands or say in these communities for general spraying, they all have to be certified. They're using uh, particular applicators to make sure we're not doing the collateral damage to pollinators in particular. Right. Um, so the biggest concern is homeowners and what. Uh, choices they make in purchasing the pesticides. Um, certain localities, like here in Montgomery County, you do have limits on uh, homeowners' applications. Uh, agriculture is exempt, and so we ask people just to, you know, protect yourselves. You, know, you still can buy, you know, off um, right. and apply it. If you go out, you know, wear long sleeves, long pants if you can stand it, and protect and, yourself and from getting I've bit. And now i because it, you, you see on Amazon or some of the internet that they've started with selling the products that are the wristbands or whatever mm -hmm. that have it, so that if you have kids and you don't want to spray them because of the DEET and all that, yep. that you can put those on, so it doesn't, you know, mm -hmm. touch their skin or, or bother them, but keeps the mosquitoes away. Yep. Because the, last weekend I was at uh, in Rockville watching all the soccer. The little kids running around inside, and I was thinking, "Oh my God! If this gets, you yeah. know, where there's a lot of mosquitoes, this could really potentially." Yeah. You know, and there's also plants in your garden that you can plant that will help, you know, keep them away. That will prevent them from coming around. So, like marigolds, they give off a smell, mm -hmm. and that can help ward off, you know, certain insects. But let me ask you: the the big question I think all of us want to know in Montgomery County, how close is Zika? Mm -hmm. 
being detected to our area? There have been some confirmed cases, not a lot. It's okay. similar to West Nile. You know, we do see a couple cases every year. Um, I think they're still figuring out, you know, because now they're also saying it's sexually transmitted. Right. So what does that mean and how you prevent it from two, you know, you got the mosquitoes and the other activities you got to be concerned about. Are pets I, at risk? I, I just want to ask, are pets at risk? I don't believe the pets are at risk, but, you know, that's a good question. We're, we're still learning a lot about it. I know that I had a trip that I was supposed to go to El Salvador and I changed my mind because I had heard from a number of clients that it had already hit mm -hmm. in El Salvador and that some of the Central American company, uh, companies, countries, haven't gotten really, you know, to spray and do whatever they need to do to try to keep the mosquitoes down and, mm -hmm. and the Zika down. And so it seems like it's slowly traveling mm -hmm. up to... Yeah. Well, one area. thing that's important is for normal people, you know, it's, it's relatively mild if you do contract mm -hmm. it. It's the pregnant women that's the biggest concern because of the birth defects that have been linked to it. But, but also if it's, if it's sexually transmitted, then if a, if a man has it mm -hmm. and then is transmitting it to, to a woman who, who yeah. is in, you know, perhaps uh, trying to have a baby, then there, we've got about a minute yeah. left. Well, I was gonna say that Savannah Guthrie is not going to go, from the Today Show, is not going to go to Brazil because she's mm -hmm. pregnant. Right. And wow. she decided yeah. that um, she would just stay and man the desk in, in New York. Yeah. Yeah, and we're seeing, and we're seeing more and more athletes coming through. What, what do you want us to do? What's the final, for, final just word? Just mainly, you, you know, protect yourselves with, you know, however method you choose, and then please empty out the containers in the yards to make sure the standing water is gone so we can prevent them from breeding. Uh, 30 seconds left, I want to ask you real quick, uh, mm -hmm. follow -up. We're seeing continued flight from farms to suburbs yes. now again, mm -hmm. right? It's a good time if somebody wants to get a farm, wants to go and be a farmer from a uh, more congested area, Absolutely, it's a good time. because we're seeing a huge surge and in increase of demand. People want locally produced products, so this is a great time to purchase. And, uh, you know, farmers talk about farming almost religiously, as a religious experience of getting out into the dirt and getting out of an office and, you know, grow and producing something. And you guys will help them develop yes. as farmers, right? Yes, we do. Rob, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Lena, welcome back. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Our associate producer uh, of this show. Um, it's you know it's it's wonderful to have you in the chair because you're one of our best guests. Oh, always. thank you, Don. Now, uh, you're the, also the president of the League of Women Voters of Montgomery County. That's correct. An incredibly important job, especially in in I think now this election year, where we've got so much confusion. People seem to be missing the boat, don't they, in terms of what the process should be in terms of intellectual discussion that you well, that yes. you all represent. And I have to say that's one of the things that we're the most proud of, that we really do try to make voters become informed, try to provide the the information, the civilized debates right. where everyone is respectful of everyone else, the information, which is really um, non-bias sort of fact-based information as opposed to trying to spin any story and that's what the league has always prided, prided itself on for 96 years we were formed 1920 the same year that women got the mm -hmm. right to vote uh, the league was formed because now women could vote across the nation so it went from the league of women non-voters women not being allowed <laughs> to vote you got rid of those little extra it went names the suffragists yeah. move, but into yes. the league of women voters what, what's been the best thing for you uh, in heading the local organization? Um, what's what, well, what stood out? I think it's I think it's really the lack the lack the incredible knowledge that um, people have, um, both women and men who are members of the league, and how they really work to study study mm -hmm. topics and come up with real answers. I mean, just this year in Montgomery County, we've studied liquor control, mm -hmm. what should mm -hmm. happen with that, which is a very local issue. And, but it also has ties to the state. Um, we studied a lot of different ways of voting mm -hmm. and um, how to um, rank vote, rank choice vote. That'll be one of the topics at, uh, in, uh, down in, in Washington the yeah. at the convention. Um, so there's just lots of different things that are going on. And I always important. appreciated that you guys approach things in a nonpartisan way. You know, you are looking at it from one angle or the other, but you know, what is, you know, drilling, really drilling down into the fundamental issues. Absolutely, and I think that's been true of the League throughout its history. I mean, th they were one of the first groups really fighting for um, children labor laws. That was all through mm -hmm. the 20s and 30s. That was one of the primary things that the League worked on. And then international relationships, uh, mm -hmm. the UN, getting the UN to come in, and then nuclear disarmament. And those are across the board. I mean, they're not, they were not, 
they were not partisan issues then. They were issues of lots of, uh, not party issues, but issues of different people. Linda, let me ask you, um, every state, I've lived in several states, and every state that I've been in, the League of Women Voters has been very prominent, very active in the community. But times have moved forward, and we're seeing millennials struggle with voter engagement. Mm -hmm. uh, is that a big focus right now of the League? Because we are seeing millennials say, what's in this for me? You know, we are trying to get more engagement of that age group, it, but I think just as you probably know from reading the papers, it's incredibly difficult. Yes. And I don't think we've, we, the League, have found the answer to that. Um, I mean, one of the things that we do is we register new, new citizens. After they have the naturalization ceremony, many, many Leagues across the country um, are at those, uh, at those ceremonies and offer to register the people to be new to be new voters. So I mean that we are trying to engage new new voters, mm -hmm. but um, millennials are still not something that we've gotten quite the right handle on. And I think it's a group that requires you to think out of the box because they think out of the box and how they approach life, what they're going to do. They just don't they don't really approach things the way traditionally we have. For many, many I mean, years. interestingly, at the um, at R, the Montgomery County League's luncheon in the fall, the speaker was a woman who studied millennial voters mm -hmm. and how to engage them. And she, what her research, she's a political scientist. What she found was the um, the best way to do it is to get to get them feeling engaged in high school at that right. at that young age, and that you can really make a difference and showing how you can go out and do lobbying, trying to make it uh, for people that are not English, native English speakers. Right. Let me ask you this, we got just a minute left. I wish we had so much longer. Is this convention, uh, this annual convention, what are you hoping to get out of it? Well, there's so many different topics. Um, I was just thinking, um, we all know about the tragedy in Orlando, Florida. Um, the Florida League is doing a presentation on the work they're doing with their state legislature. Mm -hmm. This is planned on, months on guns, ago. On gun violence. On guns. Yeah. On gun violence. And what to do um, at that state legislature uh, to change the gun laws in Florida. So um, I, I think just those, hearing what local leagues are doing, how they are really getting together, trying to get out the vote, trying to change laws that are passed that require IDs for voting. There are other states that are working really hard on that. There are just a lot of topics. And so I think it will be something that will be incredibly valuable just to hear what other people are doing. Well, thanks, Lena. And also thanks for reminding us about Orlando. Uh, we're all still numb. And, uh, and good luck uh, this weekend. Thank and, you. and may you have a very, very successful conference. We'll be right back. And we're back. It is so great to have you back here. Thank you. Thank you for having me back. So what are we talking about today? We're talking about women. We're talking about women. And what does it mean to say the women voter? Or what are our, the women issues? And so I think, you know, some folks are still stuck on, you know, women only care about, you know, the reproduction rights and maybe just their family. But women have been in the workforce for decades now. Um, we have concerns about you know, the disparity in wages, you know, getting a fair wage. We have issues with regard to taxes because mm -hmm. as earners, we are concerned about what's going, where our taxes are going, what is going on. We are concerned about education. We are concerned about foreign affairs. So to say that the women issues is a limited um, category, I think is wrong. I have to, as you go through this whole list, it reminds me of some of the discussions we've had about what's on the immigrant community's right. minds. Where going through, well, it must be about immigration. No, it's about this whole world of what's important to my family, to our future, and not only our own future, but, but the country's future. And right. the same thing, women, I mean, to, to come in, I mean, we, we right. hear this criticism, and maybe we might come in on this, is, is so many women pushing back saying, you know, Hil I'm, I'm voting for Hillary Clinton because she's a woman. No. no. I'm looking to the person who's going to best represent, you know, especially during the primary. And and so it's not like the need No, I mean, it's, it's not. So much there's more. like, uh, you know, when I was listening to the different um, news channels and they were talking about, oh, women will vote for Hillary. I'm like, well, wait a minute. 
You know, the, the, the thing is, is she covering and representing my concerns on the issues that are important to me? And in this scenario, yes, she does. But there are other candidates, and there have been other female candidates, who don't represent what I well, feel comfortable with. And so I would not vote for her. But just because someone, and the same thing, if it were right. a Latino candidate, right. am I going to vote for a Latino candidate? I disagree with some well, Latino instance, For instance, I'm thinking of someone who's got really incredible long eyesight, uh -huh. who can be on the Canadian border and see Russia from her front lawn, <laughs> who, if, you're, if you think that Hillary has all those things, <laughs> yeah, she might not be the same. I'm sorry, I, but so how do you feel right now? I mean, looking into the campaign, do you feel that the, the do you feel that, that both candidates that both candidates are representing women's issues well, or I think that one candidate is maybe a, a little bit more focused on what women issues are and understand what they are, and that, that they're beyond the you know reproductive and and you know what's what's going on with my kids issue, and takes into consideration the professional. Uh, woman, as well as not leaving behind anybody, the right. the the stay home moms and stuff like that. But oh, Marianne, I do have a question because we we often hear this term, women's issues. Um, what are the concerns? And we always refer to elections. Right. But I always become concerned with, and we talked earlier that there is uh, the the world's largest retailer. Mm -hmm. Women only recently had to go to the courts to get pay parity, um, but not just pay parity, but to be get promoted into management. Exactly. Um, and you look at, uh, we have a large media corporation here in Montgomery County that doesn't have a single woman on its board. Well, I, you know, when I hear that they say, oh, we've cracked the glass ceiling, you know, we've, we're, we're, I feel like we haven't even come close. And, and I feel really honestly that we're maybe 20 years away from that because I and think you can't expect the first generation to really and crack I would, that. And I would, I would agree with you. I mean, listening to my daughter about business school, which is only about a quarter women, her, her business school that she went to, and she is incredibly good in math. That's really one of her talents. And she frequently had people say to you, oh, oh math girl. You can do that. No, not math girl. They were surprised. Like that she was. That she was. Right. No, that's what I mean. And right. that she could do, she was the one to turn to to get right. your your um, equations solved, or your problems right. solved. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And I think, so I, I mean, there's business school and this is what, 40 years after I went to law school and business school is Oh no, no and difference. I don't think that it's, I think we need to look and hope that our second and third generations will really be the ones to be able to do that because they'll be coming from families that have the mom that's been working right. and the dad that's mm -hmm. been working and so they're they're going to have that independence of thinking how am I going to support myself. We've got about know, 30 seconds myself. left. So um, it, 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 where are we headed uh, in, in this? What do you, what do you want to see coming in, out of this election? And, this election. And, and well, I'm hoping that this really will give an opportunity to redefine women issues to make it a more encompassing of the general, all the issues that are important because we are in the markets, we are at home, we are shoppers, we are yeah. all of it. So to take it away from just the reproductive and just, oh, let's just deal with those issues on the side because women is a large population in this country. We're voting and you need to treat us as the intelligent people that we are who are making our selections based on Perfect. how you're going to represent us as a politician. Mariana Cordier, it's always a pleasure to have you. It's here. a pleasure. Thank you. Hurry back. <laughs> Tony, welcome. Thank you. Thank you uh, so luckily, you didn't have to uh, uh, come very far <laughs> Absolutely. to the studio. Love to be home. As I say, one of the grand poobahs of, of MCM, one of the uh, individuals who spearheaded so many of the things that's made MCM such an exciting place right now. I, I want to congratulate you on the Josiah Henson uh, efforts before we get to all these different programs. Tell us a little bit about that, if we could lead in with that, if you don't mind. Well, the team at Montgomery Community. And who was Josiah Henson first? Oh, yeah, Josiah Henson was a slave uh, that, was a, that had been resident here in Montgomery County. What makes him unique? Um, unlike Harriet Tubman, who's fortunately going to be on the currency soon, um, Josiah Henson, when he became part of the Underground Railroad and took slaves north to Canada, he purchased acreage in Canada, and every slave that he took north, he actually made them learn a trade. And when emancipation came, they all came back to the United States with a skill that made them self-sufficient, and that's what separates him. His, he was about self-determination, and he used his eloquence uh, of English that he used in his ministry to to advance that whole portion of being self-sufficient. It's and, a great story. And here you are, an MCM working together with the county executive and 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 absolutely. 
Okay. We're working with the, with the, the White House. Montgomery County Parks Foundation, the White House. Uh -huh. um, all of us are coming together because Montgomery County is going to build the Josiah Henson Park Museum and Education Center to really spread this common story of self-sufficiency, self-determination, um, raising the collective us. Now, fantastic, and that's a great lead to what you all are doing on a day-to-day -day basis throughout the summer of empowering young people, especially in, in the media. And maybe you could share some of that, what's going on here. We have a fantastic team here that has done some incredible programming. Um, we have uh, two camps uh, that are going in three sessions. <coughs> One is backpack journalism, where the students learn to be their community storyteller. And they go out and they become the oh, editor. Incredible. It's, it's awesome. awesome. They learn to edit their stories, collect their stories, do their interviews, post them up. Uh, unfortunately, our first camp is nearly full. We have vacancy for one more student. And then we also have... What, what grades? Uh, yeah, what uh, we're taking them from middle school all the way through high school. So we ask you, you must be at least 12, but um, we want you all to really contact mm -hmm. us. It's a great program. Um, and, and we do have a website that you can go to register your child and check out vacancies. That's mymcmedia.org, M-Y-M-C-M-E-D-I-A.org. Um, we also have an exciting program. Every kid loves a green screen. Yeah. And as a matter of fact, <laughs> right. our, our producers here <laughs> love the green screen. And so we Maybe. have a green screen camp where the kids will learn to make productions using the green screen. And they can do everything from getting caught up in a tornado to, you know, <laughs> having a little Superman. animation and flying like <laughs> Superman. This is really where the, the students come in and have a blast. Um, we, again, have had such great success with that program. We only have one vacancy left. Um, is that the same age group? That's the same age group. And then we have a second session that is very much open right now for backpack journalism in July. And so please go to our website and enjoy that. Um, the other great news, uh, we have a multimedia explorers group. Mm -hmm. It's the only one of its kind in the nation. And the students come here and they become reporters. And we have young ladies and young men who come in and create their stories. One group decided not to do uh, storytelling as reporters. They decided to do their own horror show. Oh. Oh. And the kids got together and created their horror film. Mm -hmm. So, you know, anything they can create we offer them the opportunity to do it. Do you put these up onto YouTube and yes. so everybody can view them? I'm okay. so glad you brought that up. <laughs> if you go to youtube.com, mymcmedia, forward slash mymcmedia, so it's youtube.com forward slash mymcmedia, you can actually see these kids' works. Awesome. Well, I know that um, one of the great things about this is how the kids go on in college and later to really apply these skills and go on mm -hmm. to careers. Lena, thank you so much for bringing that up. <laughs> um, as a matter of fact, the uh, 2016 Mitch College Park, Michelle Chavez, started out right here at MCM in backpack journalism. Uh, she used her skills from here to go on to be on, uh, she has a contract with C-SPAN, she was on Univision, she's right now at, uh, I believe, NBC. Um, so the students here go on to just do phenomenal work. It's exciting because you're doing, back to the beginning of, of, the, of the station, uh, was so many when we, there's a, de a daily TV show. Uh, a news program. So many of those folks are now all over the country playing great roles in the continuing in the news media. And so really it's kind of it's a back to the future thing. It's, it's fantastic. Right. 30 seconds left. Where do you see this going? Where do you see MCM going? Is, are, we, have we, is, are we at the pinnacle or there's still much more to go? No, MCM is growing like gangbusters. We're here for the residents of Montgomery County to tell their stories. Um, at the uh, fall, we should be able to have you upload your own story to our website, and we're going to make it easier for you to tell your story. Perfect. And, and we gave you just enough time to tell your story. So yes. thank you, Tony. Thank you and so thank much. you for telling your stories, folks, and being here with me. And thank all of you in the viewing audience for joining us this week for this edition of Montgomery Week in Review. I'm Don Moores, inviting you to join us next week at this very same time.